safety from this. I'm worth something now because of where I live, what I drive, what my house looks like, fill in the blank, whatever you want. Those are the things that become greed. The third reason why a desire becomes greed, it is the issue of trust. Often the condemnation of the desire for money in the New Testament when it's covetousness is, I want this so that I don't have to trust in God. My future is secure because of what I own and often people who are doing that, they are crowding God out. The issue is who determines uh, uh, who determines your decisions? If your decisions are made by money, I can't come to church because I'm making money to secure my future. That is, you have made it a God that it is wrong. But if your trust is fundamentally in God and you're honoring God, you can ask God for whatever you want. How do I know this? Because the Bible tells us about numbers of rich believers. So obviously, the Bible says, when it says of Abraham, he was very rich, and it lists all the things that he owned. Could he have done with less donkeys or cattle or whatever it lists in his wealth? Of course, but God doesn't have a problem with you having things. That is not greed in itself. If it is envy-based, if it is your image or your self-worth, or if it is going to take the place of God in trust and obedience, then it becomes wrong. Okay? So I want to clarify that. There is nothing wrong with asking God for better things, more things, et cetera, et cetera. It is, uh, it is keeping it in balance and perspective. Okay, I wanted to deal with that. Now, let's, let's recap. Basically, what I'm going to do before we pray is I'm going to remind you of what we've looked at for the last 15 lessons. This is the 16th and, and final lesson. Let's begin. This is the, the title of the lesson is called the prosperity strategy. We're going to get very practical. How do we prosper, get a breakthrough in finances? Let's begin. Let's talk about the mind and the mouth. Very, very important that we must reject wrong teachings about money. And we went in detail in these. The point of this is not to go into detail. But some of you, you have been taught things about money that are, they don't line up with the Bible. They're wrong. It is wrong to believe that money is evil. Often misquoting 1 Timothy. Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's wrong. I reject it. You need to reject that false teaching. Or that somehow you are more spiritual if you don't have money. You're on a better plan. I'm better than those one percenters. That is wrong. That is completely wrong. It's not, it's not uh, biblical. And as we pointed out, God blessed the father of our faith with a lot of money, a lot of wealth. So we reject it. The other part, in your thinking, you must reject the lie that it would be rude or presumptuous to ask God for financial things. There are people, they have no problem asking for salvation. They can pray even for healing, for other things. But the thought, your card only works two days out of the week. It's a curse. Why don't you pray for a better one? Uh, I, I don't want... Like God's going to be in heaven going, I'm busy saving the world. You're daring to ask me for a car that works. So we reject that. That is not true. I tell you, God wants you to ask him for help. Okay? He wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. So the first thing we have to do, and we'll do this, all of these we will pray about. But we have to reject wrong teachings about money. And often these are things that we have said. We have said it would be unspiritual or we said money's evil. We reject that. If you're going to prosper, you must reject false teaching. The second thing is that we recognize that poverty is a curse. 
In fact, it is that anybody who tells you to be poor is spiritual, biblically, poverty is always listed as a curse. It is something unhealthy. It is not something to be aspired to. It is listed in Deuteronomy as part of the curse. So it is something, actually, a curse is demonic. It's from hell. There are generational curses of poverty. Some of you in your family, not only have you struggled with money, your parents have struggled with money, your grandparents have struggled with your brothers and sisters, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, the cat, the dog, everybody suffers financially. That is generational, which is exactly what the Bible says in Deuteronomy. It talks about a curse that is passed on. And uh, so we, we have to recognize that and we reject it. That is not God's portion for you. Then, of course, there are personal curses of poverty. Generational is, you know, I have no idea what my relatives were doing. Uh, knowing some of my family, it wasn't good. They weren't holding Bible studies all their life. I can tell you that right now. So the idea is they can do things that affect you without you even asking. I didn't ask for my family to curse me in that sense, but it, that's a biblical principle. But then there's personal curses. There are cursed sins the Bible speaks about. I'm not giving a full teaching on this. Before salvation, of course, it's possible that we took part in sins that open a door. This has nothing to do with forgiveness, has nothing to do with are you a Christian, is the open door. I often say a curse is like this. If there are flies buzzing in your house, landing on your food and you don't like it, the obvious question is, is the door open? You, you, can't, you can't say, I bind you, fly. The door's open. Close the door. Curses are like that. You've opened the door in the past. You're forgiven. You're saved. But there still is a curse at work. And then, of course, we talked about this. There can be disobedience after salvation. There are some of you, you have not tithed. And you knew, knew that you should. That curses you. Malachi speaks about that. It, it releases a, a, a curse. And, of course, there can be different kinds of, of disobedience. Then we understand, biblically, that poverty is an assault. Job is a righteous man. He's not doing something to invite a curse. But a number of messengers come in a row... We know the devil says, let me touch what's in his life. And circumstances are, you know, fire came from heaven, burned up the sheep, which was money to him. Enemies came. Some of you, that is the story of your life. Every time I get ahead, the transmission falls out of the car, the refrigerator breaks, a child breaks his arm, uh, the dog has to go to the vet, you know, whatever it might be. And so, therefore, you're always, you lose your money in, in often strange ways, coincidental ways. That's from hell. That is not normal. Some of you, it has become normal. You, you are like Wiley e. Coyote. You're looking up for the anvil to fall from the sky when things start going well. But that is not God's will. That is a demonic assault. Biblically, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed from every curse. Generational, personal, demonic assault. We don't have to live under a curse. Let's read the scripture, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse by the law of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Okay, key word there repeated uh, uh, twice, I think, redeemed. Buy out of slavery. Sin brings slavery. One of the slaveries of sin is the curse of poverty. And some of you are, are uh, suffering that. But according to the scripture, when Jesus died on the cross, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Everything the Old Testament says 
as a curse that comes on you. We have been bought out by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not only is the curse of poverty not at work, but he says what should happen, this is New Testament now, what should happen to every believer, not cursed, but blessed? The blessing of Abraham, that is spiritual, supernatural, it also is financial. Is you should, you qualify, I should say, for financial blessing. So therefore, by salvation, the devil has no more right to, to uh, curse us. By repentance, when you repent of your involvement, and then, uh, uh, and then when we take the authority that God gives to every believer, poverty is a curse and we reject it. So that's a key to getting free. Third thing is there are wrong mentalities that we may have had that keep us from prospering. We, we did a whole lesson on this, victim mentalities. Who is responsible for your financial well-being you. If in your life you talk and say it's the evil one percenters and it's other people and it's this and that and my mean boss, you'll never prosper. The Bible says you take personal responsibility and God will help you. Also, entitlement mentalities. Who owes you? I'm talking people now. Who owes you money in life? Nobody. I'm encouraging people, give to those who are in need, but nobody owes you anything. If you just go through life with your hand out, I'm not going to work. I want you to pay my bills. That's wrong. And you won't prosper. I've never seen someone with an entitlement mentality prosper. Third thing you need to reject is feelings of guilt. Some of you, it's really hard to overcome. Some of you have been Catholics for way too long. You got saved, but you still got a lot of Catholic in you. You feel guilty for everything. We call this Catholic guilt. You don't have to be a Catholic to have Catholic guilt, by the way. But, but part of this is there are people, God starts blessing them, money starts coming to their life, and they're feeling bad. Like, should I really have this? That, that was the, the question that was asked. Can, can I live without it? Well, of course you could. But why should you when we serve such a, a, a good God? So guilt... Feelings of guilt for prosperity need to be rejected. Fear that dominates our thinking and our, uh, our actions. Some of you are afraid to be blessed because the pattern of your life is every time something good happens, the anvil falls from the sky and takes it all away. So you're afraid to even think of being blessed because you don't want to be disappointed. That's fear. You're afraid that God won't help you. Envy will keep you cursed. It will keep you in poverty. If you, have, if you resent the fact that somebody else wears something nice, drives something nice, lives somewhere nice, has something that you don't have, you'll never prosper. You cannot prosper by being angry at somebody else's blessings. And if you, again, in certain cultures, they believe the reason why they're angry, they believe in the idea of limited good, goodness, finances are a pie, there's only so many slices. And if somebody else has a good slice, they're keeping you. That's from hell. God is a creator. If he can create the world by speaking, he's never going to run out of blessing. Never. So it's foolish of you to resent anybody else who has something good. Amen. You should rejoice and say, God, you gave them something good. You can give me something good too. That is the way to uh, uh, prosperity. And some of you have spoken words of envy against other people's prosperity. You need to repent of that. And we're going to pray about that in a minute. We, some of you have accepted poverty as being your portion. Some of you, until I started teaching this, it doesn't occur to you that, that life can be different. And let's be honest, some of you, when I started this, I actually, this makes you uncomfortable, doesn't it? Is it, 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 it kind of bothers you, the idea that I've boldly said, God wants you to have more money. 
So then you, you, have to, you have to get over that. Listen, if you accept poverty, or if you, some of you here, you accept the idea that you're struggling every week, you're barely making it, I'm telling you, you're robbing yourself and your family, you're robbing the work of God, and you're robbing other people who need you to be blessed. That is why you need to be blessed. You do not need to barely make it week to week. That's not God's will. The more you are blessed, if you keep it in balance, as we've been teaching, then you'll be blessed, your family will be blessed, the work of God will be blessed, and then, of course, other people will be blessed. And then the final thing on this section is words that we have spoken against our prosperity. Some of you have spent your whole life speaking words of unbelief. It'll never work for me. I guess I can't get ahead. I never get the breaks. Those are things that release supernatural powers against your prosperity. So we're going to pray and we're going to break the curse of words that we've spoken against uh, our own prosperity. Let's talk, second section, let's talk about actions of disobedience. So the first have to do with mentalities and the mouth. The second are actions. Some of you here, you have taken actions that have worked against your prosperity. The reason why some of you are not prospering is greed and impatience. You have not been patient. You want to be blessed like your parents are older people who spent a lifetime accumulating wealth. You want it by Tuesday. That's not going to work. That's, prosperity doesn't work that way. And then greed, you want it because of envy. You want it because it's your self-worth. You want it because you don't want to trust in God, et cetera, et cetera. So what that produces in most people, greed and impatience manifest in debt. Debt is not God's will. I am telling you, debt is from hell. It's hurting you. I'm not talking about income producing you, bought something, a rental property that's giving you an income. I'm not talking about that. I'm, let's use common sense. Credit card debt, personal loans, to buy stuff is from hell. It's hurting you. You need to repent. Maybe normal, maybe everybody in your family does it. It's not God's will for your life. Debt is idolatry. If you can't wait, and if it's greed because of your image or envy, you are making an idol out of money, and plastic and a personal loan helps you to worship your idol. That's not God's will. Colossians 3 verse 5. Who's reading that? We don't have it. Wow, a mistake on the final lesson. Okay, uh, I did that to make you feel better about yourself, by the way. Uh, it was intentional. Colossians 3, 5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, sleeping with people you're not married to, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay, so covetousness, the lust for more without waiting, the lust for more so that I can outdo my neighbor, the lust for more so I don't have to trust in God, it's an idol, it's a sin. How many of you believe that fornication and adultery are sins? Okay, but in the same list he says covetousness, which is idolatry, it's also a sin. That's from hell. And the most common manifestation of that is debt. So what we have to do is choose to believe God and trust God to prosper over time. That's the key. Yeah, I, the, the point of this lesson is not, I am not promising anybody you'll be a millionaire by Tuesday. That's not the point. You're going to use common sense. You're going to believe for more. You're going to believe for miracles in, in the areas of life. But prospering takes Time. 
So we have to uh, uh, understand that. Some people here, you have failed to follow God's wisdom, which is called budgeting. You have not planned. In your, you don't have no f- plan for your money. It's wrong for you to say, God, fix my money problems and give me more money when you don't even have a budget. That's not fair. If God gives you more money and you don't operate by a budget, you'll just get into bigger problems. The great mistake of people who make poor financial decisions is if a chunk of money dropped in my life, I, lap, I would have no financial problems. Not true. This is, a, this is a statistical fact. People with high incomes just get into higher debt. Some of you here, imagine, imagine if you made half a million dollars a year. You're like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. My worries would be over, but that's not true. Some of you here, you can qualify for, you know, $8,000 in debt on your credit card. If you make half a million dollars a year, you can qualify for a whole lot more debt because they don't, they don't plan any better simply because of income. And then, of course, disobedience. What we have to do is repent of being disobedient in, in the area of money, failing to tithe, failing to give offerings, failing to obey God. If God has spoken to you in the past about giving and you said no, or you gave less than God said, that's, that's not right. He was trying to help you. Or if you failed to share with others, I am telling you, I've repeated it in numbers of lessons, money is not just for you. I will bless you and you'll be a blessing. That's kingdom prosperity. God will give you more if you will share more. He has no problem with you buying stuff, meeting a need, getting better, you know, vehicles, housing, whatever it is you need. No problem. But he didn't give you money just for you. So if your money is all just for you, that's wrong. And you have missed the point of money altogether. We need to repent of that. And then the final area of actions of disobedience is if you have failed to save to prepare for future needs. If you have no savings plan of any kind, that's wrong. Saving is holy. It is biblical. It is straight from God. Some financial planner did not make up the idea of saving. God did. And if you will honor God and begin, some of you right now, you're struggling, start small. But don't spend everything you have. That's the key to prosperity. I am saving for future needs. The point of this lesson is not I can spend every penny I get and whenever I have a problem, I'll say a little prayer and God will dump money in my lap. That's not biblical. I'm not teaching that. You save, you cooperate with God, you do what you should do in line with his word and then you believe for what you can't do. Miracles, which is we're going to pray for that in a moment. Third area is the area of doubting God. Poverty at its root, is based in unbelief. Some of you have doubted God's ability to meet your needs. You got in a crisis, and before you even thought to ask your heavenly Father to help you, you put it on plastic. You borrowed from your cousin, or your parents, or or whatever. So what you're actually saying is, You didn't think God had the power to meet your need. Some of you, it's because of how big the need was. Do you know how much debt that I have? Do you know what the, you know, my educational limitations in my job and income capacity is? So you think that God is in heaven looking at your problem like you do. Like, man, this is huge. I created the whole world, but man, your problem is big. I don't know what we could possibly do to meet the need. You're doubting God's ability. What What did God say in Jeremiah? There is nothing that he can't do. With God, all things are possible. Some of you have actually, what you've done is you, you have faith, you have more faith in the devil than you do God. 
I could get ahead, but the devil always takes it away. So, so what? Your confidence? Why don't you start singing praise songs to Satan because he's so powerful? He's not bigger than God. Circumstances. Some of you here, let's sing praise song to Joe Biden for wrecking your finances. Right? Because you have more trust in him than you do God. That, that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? If Brian sings a praise song to Joe Biden today, I have a blowgun. Of, he'll, that's not, I do not want to see that, right? No, God is able. And you need to trust in God's power. But you actually have doubted God's love. Really, some of you in your life, in your thinking, with your mouth, your approach, you have accused your Heavenly Father of not caring about you. Right? That's how you've lived, is, is apparently you don't think God cares. It's tormenting you that you can't pay your bills, and you think your Heavenly Father doesn't care about it. That's wrong. You have a very low opinion of God. Or, some of you here, you have accused God of being unfair. He's biased in his blessings. You bless them, but you won't bless me. That's foolish. Our God is very fair. If you would believe, he could bless you as well. And then overall, my point in this series is many of you have lived with far less than your Heavenly Father intends for you to have. You're barely making it. Okay, you're going to make heaven your home. But why do you want to live like that? Your financial state sometimes, I'm talking about over time, can be a reflection of your unbelief and lack of confidence in God. And again, if you're not blessed, you're robbing yourself, you're robbing your family, you're robbing the work of God, you're robbing other people. So therefore, why settle for less than God has? Okay, final thought here. The strategy of abundance then. So those, I have just summed up to you 15 weeks of teaching in 32 minutes. Summing that up then, what should we do? Here, this is very practical. Number one, we need to repent. Repent means I change my mind. I have been challenging your thinking. Some of you have thought wrong about money, thought wrong about God, about yourself. So we need to repent. If our actions, if our thinking, if our uh, uh, choices in life don't line up with God's word, we need to repent. God, we're wrong, not you. So I'm going to change my mind. That's what the word repent means, to change the mind. And then it produces a change of action. So what we need to do, we're going to pray in a few moments. We are going to repent of wrong thinking, of wrong words or wrong speaking, and wrong actions. Nehemiah 13, 11, and 12. So I contended with the rulers and said... Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. Okay, this is a, an Old Testament example. The people were thinking wrong about money. It was manifesting in greed and disobedience. Nehemiah challenges them. And he contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? You're thinking wrong. You're acting wrong. What he's actually asking them to do is repent. And how do we know that they repented? Because then they brought the tithe of the grain, new wine and oil to the storehouse. That is what we need to do. We need to repent. That's where uh, uh, prosperity begins with repentance. The second thing that needs to happen in prayer, we need to break the curse of poverty off of our lives. Let's go back to our verse, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Did I give that? There you go. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. 
He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Okay, so here is uh, uh, the verse that we just read. If we are cursed, it's not God's will. We're going to break the curse. Generational, personal, uh, demonic assault, whatever it is, being cursed financially is not our portion. You, we need to, to pray against that. Third thing that needs to happen is we need to choose to believe and trust God. I've done this whole lesson so that you come, I want, I want it to move from your head to your heart. I want this to be foundational in you. It is God's will that I prosper. That's what you need to, I can't say that for you. It is God's will that I prosper. God wants to bless me financially. That needs to be a conviction in life. You might not be blessed yet, but that needs to be your conviction. God wants to bless me financially. So if we are going to believe and trust God, that means we're going to trust God as our source of supply. My source of supply is not my boss. It's not who's in political power. It certainly is not going to be my credit card or my line of credit at the bank. I am going to trust God as my source and uh, of the source of my supply. And therefore, if my heavenly father loves me, I am going to ask my heavenly father in faith for abundant provision. I'm, I'm trusting you didn't come this morning to ask God for a dollar 63. <laughs> Our heavenly father who owns everything I was challenging you and leading up, you can't ask God too much. Luke 12, verse 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, this is a foundational scripture you need to have as part of your life in every area. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And we're talking prosperity as a part of the kingdom in this. It's not just salvation. Every area of life, 3 John 2, we've read it every single week, that you may prosper. And the Bible says God enjoys it. I, I have repeatedly told, used as an illustration, it's imperfect, but it gives the idea, any of you that are grandparents understand this. It is a joy to bless your grandchildren. It does not say God grudgingly, if you twist his arm, will say, I guess so. He likes it. He has a lot. He's willing to give you a lot. And he will enjoy doing it. That is a, a, a profound lesson of faith. The final thought before we pray. What we need to do is make a covenant with God in advance. We, we read about Jacob who did this before he had any money. He made a covenant, which is a, a binding or a strong promise. He said, God, if you bless me, I swear. That's what he's really doing. He's talking about future blessings. If you give me good things, I am going to honor you. And he, of course, he was emphasizing the tithe. So what we need to do we need to settle some things spiritually. We need to settle with God. We're going we're gonna to pray and we're going to make a covenant with God. God, I will not allow finances. I will not let money become a God in my life. How will I know? I'm not going to trust in money and I'm never going to let money make my decisions for me. I will put God first. That's how you know the good question, is it wrong to ask for things you would like? No, as long as it doesn't determine your decisions in life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's, that's how we live. If we put God first, then we can do that. So we're going to make a covenant. We're going to pray and say, God, anything you ever give me, I'm going to, uh, I'm never going to let it become a God. Then... The second part of the covenant we're going to make with God is 
I will always obey God in the area of money and finances. How do you do that? I'm always going to honor God in the tithe. There's never going to come a time where I'm going to say, gee, we're tight this month, so I'm not going to tithe. Or I'm never going to say, wow, that's a lot of money. That's a really big tithe. Always. It's a default. The only thing we do is honor God. I will give offerings of gratitude and faith. I will invest in the work of God and evangelism and church planting and world evangelism. I will obey God when he tells me to give. If God tells you something special or unique, do it. If he tells you an amount, do it. That's part of making a covenant. Oh, God, I'm going to do what you say. And the last part is, God, with everything you give me, it's not just for me. I am going to pass blessing on. Okay? I will give to others in need. I will pray for you to tell me. I'll keep an ear out, an eye out for people who are in need. You give me money, God, I promise it's not just me that's going to do well. Other people, I'm going to bless them and be a part of their life. Okay, so that is the, what we're going to do. I am going to lead you in prayer. We're going, to do, we're going to pray in two parts. The first is going to be quite lengthy because I want to pray over every part of this. I don't want to miss anything. So forgive me if I take time in doing this. At, when we finish praying, which prepares the way, then we're going to pray again, and now we are going to pray for needs. How many of you came this morning prepared? You have your needs before God. Paper, electronic device, iPad, desktop, I don't care, you, you got it with you. Okay, so we'll pray about the needs. The first part prepares the way for then we can ask God in faith for what it is. Are you ready? Okay, I'm going to pray. And what we're going to do part one is we are going to pray for God's favor. And I want you to repeat this after, after me. I want you to say this out loud, and we're going to pray from our hearts. I want you to say, God, I reject every false teaching about money. The idea that money is evil or it is spiritual to not have money. That is not true. And I reject it. The idea that it is presumptuous to ask you for money or for material things, that is wrong and I reject it. It is not your will. I break every family curse, sins my ancestors committed that have cursed me financially. That curse is broken. Every personal curse of my past sin, of disobedience, words that I've spoken against prosperity, I repent and I break those curses. I am redeemed from every curse by the blood of Jesus. And I reject every demonic assault of poverty. Devil, you will let go of my finances and you will repay what has been stolen because that is God's will. That curse is broken. I reject and I renounce every wrong mentality that has kept me from prospering. I am not a victim. I take responsibility for my own prosperity. I am not entitled for other people to give me money. I will not feel guilty for being blessed by God financially. I repent of envying other people's blessings. Envy is from hell. 
and I reject it. I reject poverty in my life. God, you want me to be blessed and not cursed. You don't want me to barely get by, but you want me to abundantly prosper. And I repent of disobedience that has hurt my prosperity. I repent of greed and impatience in my finances. I repent of idolatry, of greed. I repent of debt that is not your will. I repent of failing to budget in my finances, of failing to save and plan for the future. I repent of every action of disobedience, failing to tithe or give offerings or obey God when you told me or failing to share with other people. I repent. God, forgive me of doubting you. I repent of unbelief, of doubting your ability to help me in finances, of doubting your love for settling for less than you intend me to have. That has robbed me and my family, the work of God, and other people. It is not your will, and I repent. God, today, I make a covenant of prosperity. I promise before you, I will not allow finances, material things, to become a God in my life. I will always put you first. And I vow before you today, I will obey you in the area of money and finances. I will always honor you with the tithe. I will give offerings of gratitude and faith. And I will invest in the work of God, in evangelism, church planting, and world evangelism. I will obey you when you tell me to give and I will pass my blessings on to help other people in need. And I thank you in advance. The curse is broken, and I will be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's praise God together right now. God, I thank you for victory. Oh, God, I thank you for liberty, Lord God, for the curse being broken. God, I thank you for your love, Lord God, the good things you have prepared, the miracles you're going to do on our behalf, Lord God. I believe that you are able, Lord God. I'm believing you for a miracle dimension. From this moment on, we will be blessed and not cursed abundantly, Lord God, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Praise God. I'm, I'm telling you just that alone, some of you are going to see a breakthrough. And you need to, in every manifestation of poverty in your life, reject it. That's not God's will. Make right decisions and believe God. Okay, now we're going we're gonna to pray then. And we are going to lift up our request before the Lord. God is, uh, uh, he is a good God. He's a big God. He is able to bless, and I'm trusting that you came prepared. We are going to now ask God for what it is you have written down, what you have typed out, and whatever way that you have it recorded. Part of the reason why I wanted you to have it written down, if you've got a good memory, you could, of course, keep it up here. But what I really would like is I would like you to later on be able to show me to show your family, show other people, look at what I prayed for and look what God did. It's a testimony. Through the years, you know many times I've preached, challenged your faith and asked you to write things down. It's very encouraging when people bring me pieces of paper and they talk about these people that got saved, we prayed for, God met that need. 
it is something, it's a memorial. And that's what I want it for the future. I also want to, I don't want you to forget it. I want you to be able to come back again and again and say, God, this hasn't come in yet. I'm, that's what I'm asking you for very specifically. So some of you, you have written down amounts of money that you need to pay off debt. Some of you, it is vehicles that you need. It's housing. It is uh, whatever it might be in finan finances. We are going to ask God. I have written down here some things Lisa and I uh, uh, discussed last night and this morning that we are believing God for personally. We are praying, of course, for our churches. We want our uh, uh, churches out of Prescott also to be blessed financially. And then I'm, I'm asking, I'm going to tell you one thing that's on my list so you can be praying. Many of our churches have rented forever. I am asking God, and you can, you can write this down so you can pray as well. I'm asking God to give us a one-time gift of $5 million that I will use so that we can help other churches buy buildings. Because I don't want to take world evangelism money to help people with buildings, right? We have money that comes in. I want to use it for the purpose intended. I'm asking God, he can do that, and I ask God very specifically, I don't want it to be five million over 10 years, I want a one-time gift. I believe God is able to do that. So I'm just challenging your faith, you help me to pray. Some of you, it's a lot of money for you, but our God is big. Okay, are you ready to pray? If it's paper, I want you to hold it up in the air. Amen, we're gonna pray together, and I'm gonna ask God, if it's electronic, that's fine, you got it on your phone, hold your phone up. We're going to believe God. Are you ready? I want you to say this out loud. I want you to say, God, I am asking you for miracles in my finances. I need you to meet these needs. I have written them down. You are able. You are more than able to meet the needs that I put before you today. You want to bless me. And so by faith, I'm asking you for miracles in my finances. I'm asking you for miracles in our church and in our churches out of our church. We're asking you for miracle money so that we can be blessed the work of God can be blessed and other people can be blessed. God, I will contend for this blessing and I will share the testimony of your goodness with other people to encourage their faith. And I thank you in advance for miracle supply in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God together right now. God, I thank you. Oh, God, I'm thanking you right now in advance, Lord God. Open the windows of heaven right now. God, cause people to view us with favor. God, cause supernatural abundance to be released. God, meet the needs in every area. Money and housing and vehicles. Everything they've asked you for, Lord God cause there to be the favor and the blessing of Abraham in our lives and I thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Thank God we're going to be dismissed in the morning service. I'm going to preach. I'm going to tell you a great story to challenge your faith that will help you as well for this. Keep this. Pray over this and let me know when God answers your prayer. God bless you. Service will start at 1030.